Together with this, of course, we have the, refu the so-called refugee crisis, which is, of course, also part of the reserve army, reserve army of labor, and the question of migration. Nowadays, in a very fashionable post-colonial studies, uh, it's very politically correct to speak about the, of course, huge dramas of uh, slavery, speaking about 15 to 8 million people that were forced and treated as animals to go from Africa to the plantations in America. But the level of forced migration among free workers in capitalism has reached a point of 10, 20, 30 times more. So the number of people that cannot live properly in their own countries namely because uh, they cannot find a job or cannot find a proper job has increased dramatically. At the same time, uh, as we are speaking of the new world disorder, I shall underline that if in London in 1864, we had the, in the International Workers' Association, the main goal was to organize strike funds among workers from different countries to avoid the competition of workers and to help solidarity among workers. What we have now is on one side, the liberal approach based on human rights that people shall circulate the mass as they can in order to increase the competition of workers. And on the other hand, the extreme right with the raising of racist and xenophobic policies. So we don't have a workers' organization policy with the international and solidarity point of view towards the question of uh, the labor force around the world. I also have to underline that uh, in this, uh, we never had the level of technology and science we have nowadays, yet we have two types of uh, degradation of the working population through hunger, the so-called caloric hunger, that reaches hundreds of thousands of people that cannot have the meaning to survive, but also the nutritional hunger. So the working classes, including in the core countries, are fed it more and more by carbohydrates, by sugar, and we are experiencing a raising of epidemies as diabetes and other one, other diseases, which the studies refer inequivocally that the working classes are the ones that uh, suffer more with the lack of access to uh, a balanced diet due to low wages, namely good protein, good quality of the protein they can have access. Together with this, we exist on a, a popularization of the working class. If Mandel could wrote after the Second World War that we will experience a process of uh, relative impoverishment, the riches were becoming rich and the poor were becoming less poor, if we take out China, as me as told before, what we are experiencing is an increasing of inequality and a popularization of the so-called middle classes that are more and more uh, going in the, to through a proletarization process. I would say that. In this global world disorder, we should also put in our analysis the question of Fordism and factory labor and alienation. I saw that in one of the first numbers of Critique, the number 22, there is an article on it, Istva Mezarus, and I think we shall recover 
very deeply the analysis of Georgi Lukács and Mezaros on the question of the meaning of labor nowadays, because what we are seeing uh, in the core countries, in uh, 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 prof uh, occupations that traditionally were having control of their labor, teachers, doctors, journalists, architects, are now more and more organized in a, in a fordist way with the methods of a normal factory. By the way, the, today, the new management, which it comes from the 80s, uh, uses the same management as the factories in US in the 30s in order to increase productivity. So we have an epidemic of burnout, of so-called burnout, uh, and an epidemic of alienation, presenteeism, and um, um, mental health problems, which is an euphemism because most of these problems are not mental health problems, they are labor pro problems, uh, which the origin is the alienation of the production that separates not just manual and intellectual work, separates not just the people from the cities, uh, from the nature, not just from the cult, the people from the countryside, from the culture, they separate the brains from the hands, they separate the prefiguration of a sense of labor and make the labor, uh, labor as a source of uh, deep uh, sadness and uh, destruction of the strength of the working classes. In working classes, I'm including, of course, the uh, hospitals, the schools, which are now, so I, what I wanted to say is that in this new world disorder, we, we have not experienced the end of the industrialization in Europe. What we have experienced is a change in a labor restructuring and a restructuring process where the high uh, aggregated value of industry is still done in Europe with the composition of the working force, even in countries like England or Portugal, among 18 to 20 percent of the population is in the industry sector. So it's not true that was this the industrialized, there is a change in the industry, and the public service were, as Ursula Wunz points out, industrialized as well. Uh, what we see, uh, the, the, the constant, uh, uh, all this uh, uh, catastrophic analysis, this catastrophic uh, scenario uh, as uh, happens together with probably one of the most, if not the most uh, important crisis of uh, organized opposition. Uh, we don't see uh, a way to go out of this crisis where we don't see parties cadres outside of neo-reformist approach to be able to have an answer to what's going on. I don't want to be a pessimist. I'm just putting the questions for uh, the debate. What we see in a main, as the main answers to this uh, structural crisis, which is a crisis in economy, in profitability, in a, a, a political crisis, a military crisis, an evident cultural crisis, what we see is a bourgeoisie answer through the so-called green economy, which would imply a huge transference from the social state, social welfare state, to subsidize to the companies to make them supposedly green. And uh, what we see is the so-called tra digital transition that the pandemia as a politic of shock doctrine was used highly to intensify. So 
home, uh, home office, uh, educa digital education, uh, the so-called uh, artificial intelligence. There is no such thing as artificial intelligence, of course. Uh, all these seem now to be able to amplify in a huge way the reserve army of labor, since uh, if uh, uh, the artificial intelligence can substitute doctors, journalists, or professors, or architects, what we are experiencing uh, is a, a huge uh, amount, it's an increasing on competition of workers, and of course, also, um, uh, this comes together in the Western countries and in the US and in the cities, in the most countries in the world, of an absolute degradation of the quality of the education of the large masses of the working classes, working classes in a broad sense. We have written now an article for the next critique where, where we analyze all the uh, documents of OCDE and the uh, North America foundations promoting that <clears throat> workers in high school and in university shall acquire competences, information, and not knowledge. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, a process of a huge adaptation to the labor market and a degradation of an expropriation of the knowledge, in fact, which is, of course, comes always with the idea that uh, classes are very boring because they don't have iPads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But of course, when we go to the schools where the bourgeoisie is training their cadres, we see that philosophy is obliged until the end of the school. And instead of an online exam, you have to do an essay or a critical dissertation. So this is a class approach to education. Well, on the left, we see uh, what we could say, in my opinion, but I'm very critical, I should say. In, on the left, we see a huge uh, strength of a policy which the core of the production is the democracy in US, which is a policy based not on recognizing the differences among the working class to defend solidarity among uh, women and men, uh, fixed and uh, tenure and precarious work, uh, workers from periphery, semi-periphery and the center, uh, what we see, on the contrary, is an identity policy uh, uh, driven by, uh, based on a postmodern philosophy where uh, all kinds of differences among the working class are strained, are underlined, uh, and blockade any possible uh, unity. Just to give an example, uh, one of the main questions is the differences of salaries between men and women, uh, which uh, is basically true on a high level in poor countries, on companies' direction, etc. That's where the difference is huge. Uh, it's not in the factories or it's not in the public services. Uh, this, uh, uh, apparently, this struggle for women achieving the top of the companies with the same wage or the top of the uh, management of public services, etc., which mainly is, are directly by men, is one uh, flag of this policy, which is, for me as a Marxist, extremely odd because I thought a left policy would be against any kind of management of uh, uh, companies or public services. We were in favor of democratic management by the workers, not that women can achieve 
the same place where they go to, to practice moral harassment uh, uh, and uh, pressure over the workers in the same level as the men. Just an example of this policy. So, uh, and another example, and I will finish now with this, is this question of labor aristocracy. So, uh, all the struggles in the peripheral countries are seen by the majority of the left as something to be recognized and support. But if the struggles are among the nurses in the US or among uh, railway workers in England or among uh, truck drivers in Portugal, this is already labor aristocracy because they have to look to the huge amount of people that is in misery instead of uh, uh, claiming for uh, better work, etc. This uh, this. It makes no sense to me, but of course, because um, what, first of all, because in core countries, a strike of railway workers in England has much more damage capital than a short strike in railway workers in England provoke much more damage in uh, capital accumulation than a three months strike in teachers in Brazil. For example, so this, but and I shall go to my second point, which is all these have been um, together in the last years. Together, I'm sorry, my English, uh, I'm very tired because I didn't sleep, and when I don't sleep, I uh, my English is even worse than when I sleep. Uh, uh, all this has be, been together with this new concept that once I have to quote my make, uh, which is the concept of global south and make once in a conference said, what is this is a resort, a touristic resort. <laughs> and I found it very interesting, which is a very, of course, odd concept, which just can be understood in my point of view together with this politics of permanent splitting the unity of the working class because there is no such thing as global south. First of all, a huge part of the country's so-called global south are in the North Hemisphere. Secondly, a huge part of the so-called uh, global south has national bourgeoisies that are together and part of the same oppression sector as the northern companies. There is, so this idea, which seems to me absolutely naive and postmodern, that the world is divided. In the south, there are nice people. In the north, there are labor aristocracy and terrible companies, seems to me nonsense for uh, facing the, the huge challenges we are facing. Uh, if this was already quite ridiculous 200 years ago, how do we see it nowadays when we see a permanent uh, moving, a permanent move, a permanent migration of workers from everywhere and a permanent uh, investment of capital from everywhere to anywhere. So uh, the, the, the globalization has put the workers uh, in, a, in a permanent contact and capital uh, um, uh, is invested everywhere. And this would be a wonderful opportunity to increase the solidarity among the countries. And of course, to stress the old concept of imperialism, and with this I finish, which is, of course, that what we are experiencing since the end of the anti-colonial revolutions after the Second World War is that the, these countries have become independent formally, but not, uh, they, but they, they have been virtually destroyed in a way that people have to throw themselves to Mediterranean, dying every day. This is what we see 
in Europe every day. These people are dying because they cannot live in their countries, which were totally destroyed by politics of oil extraction or uh, monoculture of coffee or cocoa or whatever. All this is controlled by European companies, which are, call themselves social, green, etc., and with the support and the, the, uh, the, the, the complicity of local uh, bourgeoisies that in the imperialist discourse are always guilt by corruption and not allow their countries to develop <laughs> and getting what is the role of uh, the European and poor countries in this uneven uh, and combined development. What I wanted to say to end some in a very uh, positive way is that all these uh, uh, catastrophic scenario, which was designed by capital uh, uh, in the last decades, can be and can become and probably will become their weakness. Because in the same way that capital have delocated to Portugal, where you pay 700 euros to workers to work they are obliged to work even on Sunday in Volkswagen, uh, uh, do, um, putting the same, exactly the same as Charlie Chaplin in the, the 30s, but even worse, because now the role, how do you call this? Uh, production line. Production line. The production line now has something that moves below, but now if you visit the Volkswagen also above, so the worker is permanently on nights doing this. This is in Portugal nowadays. But at the same time, if these workers blockade the Volkswagen, they can blockade the production in several countries. So apparently, once I was in a meeting of dockers and the Swedish dockers uh, blockade the production, the containers in Portugal, to support the strike. And immediately the bosses gave up and uh, accepted the condition of the strikers. Because they, and for the Swedish dockers, one day of strike is nothing compared, if you compare the wages of the Swedish dockers with the Portuguese. Now imagine if the British workers would do this with India or the American workers with Mexico. Uh, what we have now is an extremely, uh, the capital expanding through all the globe. Uh, today, in fact, is just based on fear and fear is just based on lack of political organization, not lack of objective force of the working classes. And I think one of the key questions continues to be now the question of organization of the working class and the, the, the workers in core countries because of their traditional knowledge of 200 years of organization play a key role in this organization. So thank you very much. And uh, I think you know. If you focus in the rooms on the comments, could you raise your hands? Hello, uh, shall I give you the Hello. What? No. Oh, or just no. Okay. Uh, uh, come here. Uh, 
They cannot hear you if you don't speak on the microphone yeah. there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just yeah, just quick. Speaking to the mind, yeah. Yeah, just a quick question about anti-colonial anti-colonialism and the results of and the results of that. Uh, would uh, I would say, can I ask if you go into a bit more detail about that, and and also answer the answer our question of whether the world countries are more dependent or less dependent than they were back in the imperialist era. Okay, uh, cool. Uh, so shall we take a few questions? I, I think so, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Change the order. Yeah. Change the order. Change the order. Look, there's four connected crises following capital, uh, um, confronting capitalism. The first is the crisis of reproduction, whereby capitalism can only reproduce itself at the expense of society. The second crisis is obviously the climate crisis, which is coming to a head. We've got El Nino on the way back. We've got Solar 25 flaring up. They come together, they climax in 2024 summer. In the UK, for example, one can expect 45 degrees. I spoke to the doctors on the hospital picket lines. They haven't got any contingencies for hypothermia. Uh, they haven't even got air conditioning units. All they've got is windows and fan. Um, the third one is obviously, and I agree with Barney, but there's no such thing as artificial intelligence. There is such thing as neural networks and deep learning. And the holy grail of deep learning is to cull office jobs, better paid office jobs. And that obviously undermines our social stability of capitalism. That's why we've got these billionaires in the United States now calling for universal basic income because they know that it's politically destabilizing. And of course, we've got the pending war between China and the United States as the United States uh, seeks to maintain its hegemony. And the United States won't go quietly into the night, it will set the night on fire. And this is all coming together at exactly the same time. And I believe it's beyond the capacity of capitalism to deal with. So the historical question that is posed is not whether or not we're going to overthrow capitalism, it's whether in not overthrowing capitalism, capitalism drags us over the cliff of history. The, the, this decade is a decade of make or break for the human race. And I said that in 2019, and everybody said to me, Brian, you'll be a catastrophist. Now everybody's talking about party crises. Thank you. No. The, the question I'd like to, uh, to to raise and get discussed is whether green capitalism is in fact possible, because the object of capitalist production is uh, profit. It's, it's not actually ma manufacturing use values per se. If they become use values, they're all the better, but it's only if they are profitable to produce. Now, the law of value can be distorted or even depressed for a certain amount of time. You see, this is war economies, but wars don't last, or hopefully they're not intended to last for any length of time. You saw the great uh, um, manipulation of value relations, say, in the uh, belligerent countries in the first, and especially in the second world war. But these only lasted for a certain number of years, and then we moved back to more uh, market measures. We can see the suppression or the distortion of the law of value in a certain sector or two, lasting for quite a long time. But uh, and, and the law of value has always been challenged uh, under, under capitalism, but it's, it's tended to uh, exert itself quite imperiously at times through crisis. Uh, but green capitalism, where you're actually uh, distorting the whole uh, structure of capitalism, to make sure that uh, the accumulation of capital is within the sort of uh, limits which will not affect the uh, uh, environment and try and restrict uh, global warming means a permanent large scale 
restrictions or distortions of the law of value. Now, is this actually possible? Because uh, I, I just think that eventually, if you try and uh, distort the run of capitalism on a, on a big scale for a long period of time, that is going to lead to uh, the crisis of profitability. And this will cause you know, major uh, problems. Uh, economically, and of course, that will lead also to major social problems. And I do think that moving on to the climate crisis, that if the uh, global warming isn't uh, slowed down and uh, helped, that the social crisis that will emerge from the uh, fr climate crisis will be. Uh, you know, it will be a, on a far greater scale than, say, the crisis of interwar Europe, which led to the rise of uh, fascism and Nazis in Germany and the, the Second World War, which that implied. So uh, I do think that humanity is facing, within certain time, probably not as uh, quickly as uh, the last contributor said, but certainly within uh, you know, several decades, possibly an existential crisis. So um, one thing is, can capitalism deal with this? Or and the question is, is how do we deal with this? Is uh, communism possible in a place where um, the, the, the level of crisis is such that uh, you know, it would be very difficult for any economy, not only capitalist or communist one, to deal with? I think the uh, question from the chat as well. Some uh, Fernando Herrera has asked. He says he shares your uh, uh, skepticism about global SaaS, North SaaS. He's saying, could we use uh, what could we use instead to make sense of differences, world differences in terms of inequality in the post Cold War situation? Okay, shall I? Um, yeah, have a go at this and then because there's so many questions. <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, thank you. Secondly, I there are all important comments and questions I cannot answer to all, just some ideas. Let me start with something which is quite polemic, my opinion. I don't have an opinion about. Uh, uh, climate change or climate crisis. I know nothing about these subjects. And what I know is that not just in Trump or the people that are supporting petrol, there are serious um, scientists and left scientists that questioning are questioning the data that are given to us about uh, uh, climate change or climate crisis, because they speak on uh, the, the volcano activity, uh, physics changes on Earth, other questions, which I am a historian, I know nothing about this. I don't think that we need to subscribe the idea of uh, climate catastrophe catastrophe to have and to defend an ecological point of view towards capitalism. We don't need to, uh, we, we just need to look to the society and see that obviously the level, the number of people concentrated in cities, the number of people that don't have access to a proper house, the, the number of uh, intensive agriculture, which doesn't respect meaning the relation and uh, uh, human relation with nature. So I think this is obvious for us that we really have a, 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 a degradation of our relation with nature. And so this is, um, I don't think that what I, what I think capital has insisted on the question of climate change or climate catastrophe, et cetera, the, the French uh, yellow vests, they have a wonderful sentence I like to quote. 
which is we don't care about the end of the world, we care about the end of the month. Uh, answering to this idea of permanent catastrophe. We don't need to believe that the world is going to end in two weeks to recognize we are living a social catastrophe. I mean, the figures I gave in my presentation are absolutely, how can we have reached a situation where two billion people cannot even be exploited? It's not that the fact they are exploited. So this is a it's a it's a fact. Capitalism brought us to a catastrophe, which I agree with you. They don't have why they don't have the solution. Well, they always have the solution of permanent destruction of war, which they had in the Second World War towards as an answer to, to the crisis of 1929. But I think this time they have to face, as they had in the Second World War. Uh, 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 acknowledge of what capitalism can do in terms in terms of damage and the reaction of the working classes in poor countries and in cities around the world that is not easy for capital. What capital has done in the last 30 years was not just neoliberalism and flexibilization, they have developed social assistance programs. That's why capitalists are defending universal income. They are in panic with their own politics. But what I think the, the answer of the, the Marxists or the left should be is that we do not defend universal income or assistance programs. We defend that people have right to a job that makes sense to them that is, we are in the land of William Morris. We already know in the last, William Morris had the, the best ecological and labor answer to capitalism. And um, what we have to question why people don't have a job, why there are people working in a factory at night, selling what? They are producing shares at night. When you work at night, it increases the rate of cancer for 30%. Why these people, if a doctor has to work at night, we have to pay him extra, retired before. But why somebody is in a factory at four o'clock in the morning? Uh, so what we have to, to question is not, I think one of the biggest traps of the left in the last 30 years was substituting the fight for job for the fight for unemployment subsidies. This has been terrible for the left and also has given a social base to the extreme right uh, because uh, it, the question of dividing the work that exists among all workers is a question of fairness. Of course, if you are ill, if you are disabled, etc., then you have to be supported much more than a minimum income, in my opinion. But if you are able to work, you should work and work in something that gives you pleasure. So this, I, I think this is a, it's a, it's a, a, a key question. One of the things since we are experiencing since 2008 is this narrative that we have to uh, support neoliberalism, either the left neoliberal governments or the right neoliberal governments, the extreme left, as Tariq Ali says, because Otherwise, fascism is the answer. What we know about this key crisis in history, what we had in 1870, 1929, 1933, 1945, 1970s, crisis of capitalism don't have as a theological way towards fascism. What crisis of capitalism brings is class struggle. It doesn't mean that fascism is going to win this battle. So uh, uh, Ken Loach gave a, a, an a interview in kind of about his last movie, The Old Oak, and he says this wonderful sentence, which is, "Hope is a uh, lack of hope is a fascist approach to society. And this is very interesting because uh, if you say that it, uh, it's, it's now, uh, the question is, uh, it, it became a political question 
to have a program to solve the problems of capitalism. We cannot accept the nihilist self-destruction uh, view. We cannot accept that this is all, this is a catastrophe with no way out. Because accepting this, it's also a political sentence, which is very much a give up sentence. We are giving up of people if we accept this, this lack of hope approach or this idea that extreme right will certainly won. I don't know what we, how we are going to solve this catastrophic crisis. <clears throat> what I know, because I've studied revolutions, is that when revolution started, people can solve together in a democratic way the most incredible problems. A, a collective people, people, this idea of new management, if you go to a hospital, <clears throat> nowadays it's totally mess because it's a new management hospital. And they say, oh, we need a new management. No. If you want to solve a problem of the hospital, you put the nurses, the doctors, all the staff, one week debating how to manage a hospital. And you solve the problems of the hospital with this. So I think the question is, uh, the question is we need people to move and uh, um, bring back to their hands the production and the decisions of the production. Uh, the best the best mind alone, the most uh, well uh, developed uh, and serious ethic person cannot solve the problems we have in our society. We have to do it democratically, involving the people that are in the production. That's why I've asked this about socialism. I cannot understand socialism if you don't have a democratic management of production. This is, there is no, socialism is not uh, uh, just plan economy or centralized economy or expropriation of the bourgeoisie. There is no socialism without democracy. I just go, I, I think asking, answering Fernando, I would say that the new phase we are experiencing is a, the old phase of imperialism. We are living in imperialism and the centralized production, the power of core countries, as England, as France, as Germany, as US, was never so big as it is today. Because when we had the anti-colonial revolutions, and this is another big debate, we don't have time today for it, but uh, uh, the, the independence didn't solve these problems. They, these countries are totally dependent for the most basic needs of resources from the core countries, which are controlled by the core countries. So what we, uh, we cannot be afraid of the world. When we use the term of imperialism, by the way, it's not, a, not even a Lenin term. A, 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 there were liberal economists who, who, who embrace and analyze what we are seeing is a, a, a exchange who are extremely unequal between forces that control the access to the means of production. And this is imperialism. This doesn't have other name. Inequality is the result of imperialism. Inequality is not something that you can solve if you don't solve the unequal change. And I, I, I even think that is quite, um, it's quite amazing that we are now in 2023, debating if we use global south or imperialism, when we know that 62 people have the same income as half of the population in the herd. It's, uh, this is the number, it's the Credit Suisse number, it's not even my number, it's the... Um, so, uh, I think moving beyond capitalism, uh, one of the... I, I want to say this, but I don't know if I will manage to explain myself. I think one of the role of the socialist studies today, if you allow me to propose this, is to go back to some of the you know, many articles of critique. They were really debating how socialism should be. 
And I think if we debate how socialism should be and not just how capitalism is, we are developing a program against capitalism. We cannot say to people, oh, look, if we live in socialism, this, this will be wonderful. And then they ask us because they are totally right to ask us. But socialism is not a dictatorship. But there was not a political police already during the civil war. I'm totally uh, supporting the Bolsheviks, but it's true that exception measures, in my opinion, were wrong. It's true that uh, socialism is not just about electrification. It's true that Lenin, which I admire a lot, had a view of work as rationalization of scientific production, not, not just as a development of something creative you do. Why don't we face this discussion and try to start debate what is socialism? How, what, what kind of society do we offer? Because neoliberalism already said to people what kind of society they offer. Sacrifice. This is the word they use every day. You want to live in this world, you sacrifice yourself. And we say, we want to live in a world where expansion of human beings, where individual freedom, where uh, creative work is expanded. How we are going to do this without repeating the same mistakes that we're repeating in the past? I think this is one of the key tasks of the socialists. But then we have to face a, a huge self-critic, not in the sense of the cultural revolution of the Maoists, but uh, we have to look ourselves to the mistakes that were done and learn with them. At least somebody already did them. Let's try not to repeat these mistakes since others will certainly go into. Thanks very much. Unless there are any other questions, I'm going to ask Hannah to speak uh, as a kind of summing up of uh, the day. We are at five o'clock, so we'll have maybe five minutes or more, but uh, I give you time, Hilal. Can you take the microphone? Oh, have I have I put the microphone? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, oh, go ahead. It shut. Shut, okay. Okay, um, you want me to speak now? Yes, because we are at the end of uh, the meeting. So if you could say a few words about the future, yeah. about the journal. Thank you, yes. Go ahead. Um, okay. Well, <clears throat> I, um, I found this conference actually somewhat better than I expected to be. Can you sit back, back from the camera? We can't see you. You're too near to oh. yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I think the conference went uh, exceptionally well. The different topics were well tackled, and it went over the range of uh, issues. Of course, the uh, uh, a fundamental issue underlying everything is the, uh, the class nature of our society, of global society, but of our society in uh, in uh, particular. And uh, the uh, efforts that have been made at different times to try and develop an understanding of that exploitation and uh, and the issues which are involved, it, it's clear that uh, in the past thirty years, the situation has been more difficult for the left than the previous sixty years. In fact, uh, but it does seem as if uh, things are beginning to change, and I think this conference has more or less uh, brought it out, brought out uh, from the various individuals explaining in their own way the particular disciplines in which they involve and shown um, 
how the system in fact operates and how it's not operating um, in, in, in fact um, I think we have a reasonable understanding of how capitalism works obviously we've had the development of that understanding 200 years ago with Marx and subsequent writers <clears throat> from Lenin, Trotsky, and then a host of the individuals who have written on, on the subject. I, I think the talks that, that I've heard have been um, excellent. They have developed the uh, understanding of the present. And I have to say that in general, of course, there is very little writing on the uh, on the nature of the uh, forces are which are working at at the moment. And the, the last speaker was very good in bringing that out. I think <clears throat> the, the uh, different laws which are in fact operating <clears throat> in relation to individuals who are at work or not at work. <clears throat> I, I think, in general, the conference has gone extremely well. We've had a reasonable, we've had a reasonable number of people come. I'm sure there'll be quite a lot of people who will want to listen to it when it uh, appears on the uh, on the on the radio or TV. And I, I think I'm, we should thank everybody for coming, and thank the people who've spoken. Thank you very much. <clears throat>